All right, well, if we kick off our Wednesday night class. <clears throat> Today, we've got the, the last guy we're going to look at is going to be James, the brother of Jesus. And we use James as one of the proofs of the resurrection because all the way throughout Christ's life, James and his other brothers uh, did not believe that Jesus was anything special. As a matter of fact, they tried to put him in his place and they sometimes tried to embarrass him because of all the ruckus that was going on around Jesus. So we start out looking uh, up at Capernaum where Jesus made his home uh, even though he was born in Nazareth. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit above the Sea of Galilee there in Capernaum is where Jesus made his home. And if we take a look at Mark chapters 1 through 3, we pick up the Jesus story in Mark that Jesus is doing all kinds of uh, teachings in the synagogue and he is making a big impression. He's making a big splash because of the works that he does, because of his teachings. And people are not liking that this local boy is attracting so much attention. So that's where we pick up when we pick up in Mark. <clears throat> uh the Jewish authorities are starting to persecute Jesus because he's been healing on the Sabbath. Uh, he's breaking the Sabbath rules. Jesus said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. And so they didn't appreciate that too much. Uh, they were accusing Jesus and his disciples that they did not fast and they were supposed to. And they also, by chapter three, they've accused Jesus of being Satan himself because he's casting out demons because he is a demon. And so you can see that the uh, hubbub around Jesus was not positive. It was a very negative vibe. And then uh, we bring in his family who had to be a part of all this. If you can imagine your kid getting all this unwanted negative press, and of course you as his family is going to feel caught up in all of that. So when we look, Mark chapter 3 <clears throat> and verse 20 we're going to see what kind of an effect all of this publicity was having on his family. Mark 3 and 20. <clears throat> and we see, uh, then uh, he went home. He being Jesus went home and then a crowd followed him home. They, they gathered there again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard of it, they went out to seize him because they were saying he is out of his mind. He was attracting so many people that they were just nervous being related to him. They tried to go out and get him out of the crowd, concerned that Jesus was out of his mind. A little later in verse 31, his mother and his brothers came and they were standing outside and they sent to him and they called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said, your mother and your brothers are outside and they are seeking you. So his family did not like this open air ministry that was attracting so much attention and actually very negative attention. Uh, three, and that was 31. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to jump on down to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. And uh, this is a fascinating section of Scripture. There's so much to get out of it. So Mark 6, beginning in verse 1, He went away from there, and He came to His hometown, and His disciples followed Him. And on the Sabbath, He began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard Him were astonished. They said, Where did this guy get these things? What is the wisdom that has been given to this guy, how are such mighty works done by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James? And that's the name you guys want to hold on to. Isn't he the brother of James? I'd put a square around that. And Hosus and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us. So they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own hometown, among his own relatives and his own household. 
So even Jesus was dejected uh, in his own home there because people weren't believing in him. And actually, I didn't give you guys this one, but a little bit later, after his three-year ministry, Jesus actually cursed Capernaum because he said, if the works that I did in you had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented. So cursed are you, uh, Capernaum, for not having repented. I forget where that's at, but you could look it up. Cursed are you, Capernaum. So needless to say, Jesus is not going to be people's favorite up there. I want to draw your attention to some things here. In uh, verse 2, there is some, uh, the original here, you can't tell it from the English, but the original lets you know that these were derogatory comments. So you can put a square around these to help yourself determine the difference. But in verse 2, it said, Many who heard him were astonished, and they said, Where did this man? I'd put a little square around this man because they used a de derogatory pronoun, and really it means this guy. Who's this guy? Uh, there's a pronoun. It is. Autos is a pronoun for he or him. Autos with an A. Uh, hutos. So this is what it should have been. Where is this guy? Um, oh, I can't remember if it was that. But, um, no, it's this. Uh, so this would have been the proper pronoun, autos. Who is he? But they didn't use it. They used this, hutos. And that is a derogatory form. Who's this guy? What's this? Uh, like with disdain. So they used it right there. Where did this guy get these things? And then they used it again. What is the wisdom that's been given to, and if you put a square around, to him? To him. Again, it's the derogatory. This guy. Who gave him this kind of wisdom? How are such mighty works done in his hands? Now there's the autos. There's the regular pronoun. So they missed an opportunity to degrade him again. They use the regular one. And then they say it again in verse 3. Is not this the carpenter? I'd put a square around that word this. Is not this. Because that's the derogatory. Who's this guy again? They're referring to him as somebody insignificant. <clears throat> and then uh, the next word that's interesting is they took offense. I'd put a square around that word. Uh, took offense. Took offense. Scandalizo. Scandal, scandalizo. Scandalous. You, you hear the word that, that's in there? Scandalous. So the word they took offense is this word scandalizo. And uh, scandalizo is a, is a trap. It's like, a, if you can imagine some of the, like a basket that they would put up on a stick. And then a bird or a squirrel flies in there and they pull the stick and it gets trapped in the basket. That's the literal meaning for this word, trapped. And so the way that it applies here is it creates this sense of animosity because on the one hand, they have to admit that he's doing incredible things. On the other hand, they don't want to admit it because he's just a local boy. Isn't he just the carpenter from Nazareth? Isn't he just, uh, just Mary's son? Isn't he just... James's brother, this guy is nobody special. He's a local guy. He's the carpenter, the local carpenter. So they are trapped in this box because they can't refute what he's saying and doing, but they hate, they don't want to acknowledge him as a prophet because he's just a local guy. And that's the idea of this word, scandalizo. If anybody, have you been watching uh, the, uh, the, uh, what was what, what President Trump? Yeah, President Trump's thing recently. You, the State of the Union. You could you could say President Trump was scandalizo because uh, uh, what's her name? Nancy. Nancy Pelosi was sitting behind him scowling. 
just did not like all the good things he was doing because he's just this guy that they know. He's just a business guy. He's not a good leader. And so it's that idea of people that are, when they're torn between not liking the guy but not being able to refute the good things that he does, what do people do? Impeach. <laughs> so they wanted to impeach Jesus, you could say, because they were not happy with him. So anyway, his brothers were like that. His family was like that. And then Jesus said, you can't do anything great in my own hometown because nobody in your hometown views you as a, a prophet. It's kind of interesting, you know, uh, when people have lectures and seminars, if you have an old local boy doing a lecture, it doesn't attract a lot of attention. But if you fly somebody in from far away, it attracts a lot of attention. So that's kind of the thing that Jesus was in. <laughs> so they took offense at him. They were caught. Uh, there was a, I'm on, I'm on page two here. There's that quote in the middle of the page. He said, now this was very interesting. In Jesus' time, no, no people could boast of more prophets, more learned scribes and rabbis and savants than the Jews. The field in which Jesus had distinguished himself as a teacher was, in other words, crowded and competitive. His prestige caused a dilemma for the people that were acquainted with him. However, for he had not been apprenticed to any famous rabbi, nor could his wisdom be accounted for at home. He had no, I think we'd call that no pedigree. He didn't have PhD behind his name. He didn't have a doctorate degree. He was just a lowly carpenter. So they didn't like acknowledging his work. This other guy, uh, the quote right beneath that, when people can't refute the obvious and they refuse to give it credence because of the poor pedigree, the result is always tension and anger and animosity. <clears throat> that was why Jesus said that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. So that's the feeling of his hometown. That's the feeling of his family. That's the feeling of his brothers and sisters. And then, huh? That's, that's I think, in John 7, 13. Right? Yeah, let's read that. Yeah. Page three there, we're going to go John chapter seven and verse four. He says, for no one, his brothers were, it was Passover and his brothers were telling Jesus to go down to Jerusalem to go to the feast because anybody that wants to be famous goes to Jerusalem to become famous. And then he answers them. They're talking to him here. No one who wants to be known publicly acts in secret. Since you're doing these things, Show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. So in our, our talking point here, what we're talking about is we see these overnight changes in certain people that didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe in the movement, hated the Christians, loathed the Christians, and yet these same people almost overnight change positions and they now become believers in the resurrection of Jesus. James is one of these people and we're looking at and so we're going to look at there was a change in Jesus's brother. We go from him not believing in his brother, having disdain for his brother and after the cross resurrection event, James now is going to become what most people say is the primary leader of the Christian church in Jerusalem. So we'll look at that. Uh, Paul was one of the people that had witnessed Jesus' resurrections. And uh, historians have said that they like his manuscripts the best. They have the best attestation historically. And so we've got about 12 of Paul's manuscripts. One of them is the letter to the Galatians. And Paul writes here about meeting Jesus' brother James. Galatians 1 and verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, which is Peter, and remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except for James, 
the Lord's brother. So notice that this is about, we, we have Paul's conversion, Paul's uh, going to persecute the Christians in Damascus, and by the time he gets to Damascus, he believes in the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth, and he's preaching Jesus' resurrection because he had an encounter on his way to Damascus. That was two years after the resurrection. He says, three years after that, I went and met James's brother, who was a leader in Jerusalem. So within five years, we've got an account already of James taking a leadership role in the Christian church in Jerusalem. Paul writes again a little bit later in that same manuscript, the book, the uh, Galatians, in verse 9 there at the bottom of page 3. And then James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, and they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and them to the circumcised. So he lists James, Jesus' brother, Peter, and John to be pillars of the church in Jerusalem. That would be his second visit back to Jerusalem, which we know was 14 years later. 14 years after his conversion. Paul writes another manuscript, a letter to the Corinthian churches. And in that manuscript, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 3, he's going to mention uh, all of Jesus' brothers being active in the church. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 3, This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Peter? So that is uh, a manuscript to the Corinthian church about 56 AD. So that's about 26 years after the cross resurrection event. And he's saying that Jesus' brothers are all active in the ministry and that they are even being supported by the church. And Paul is saying, isn't it fair that I should be supported if all these other guys are being supported as well? We've got some non-biblical sources that corroborate uh, information about James. In uh, I gave you the quote there. Civilizations of the Ancient Mediterranean, Volume 2, which is uh, Greece and Rome. Page 1049, uh, there is this little tidbit. Whatever little information is preserved indicates that the members of Jesus' family continued for some time in positions of leadership. Some of these Jewish Christians also maintained Aramaic as their religious language using an Aramaic translation of Matthew's Gospel. Also in that same history book, there is an account of one of the times, it was called the, uh, I think it was called the Jerusalem Council, when Paul came back to meet with the pillars of the church in Jerusalem, James, John, Peter, to find out what do we do with these Gentile Christians? Do we force them to obey Jewish laws like the Jewish Christians? Or what do we do? And so this is one of the visits that I already read to you that's also recorded in this book, Civilizations of the Ancient Mediterranean. I'm on page five, you guys. <clears throat> At the top, I put a copy of it. Uh, this meeting, the first period of the missionary work in Arabia, Syria, and Cilicia led to conflicts with the followers of Jesus in Jerusalem, who still insisted that the law of Moses must be kept by all converts to the new religious movement. The conflict was resolved by a conference in Jerusalem. He calls it the Apostles' Council in A.D. 49. Uh, typically in the church we call it the Jerusalem Council. Anyway, he says, in which Jesus, the bro in which Jesus' brother James, along with Peter and John, agreed with Barnabas, Paul, and Titus, a Gentile, that the Gentile converts should not be obligated to observe the law that the mission to the Gentiles should be an independent organization in its own right, with its own leadership. So this is now 19 years. If he puts this council in AD 49, that's going to be 
Yeah, 19 years after the cross resurrection event that uh, this historian records that meeting in Jerusalem and says James was the leader there. Next one down, uh, Howard Marshall is uh, specialized in the historicity of Luke's manuscripts, Luke and Acts, Professor Emeritus, University of Aberdeen, Scotland. And he also talks about Peter and James at this Jerusalem council. The decisive voice in the meeting, however, lay neither with Peter nor with the delegates from Antioch, but with James. This may have been due partly to the position which he increasingly came to hold as the foremost leader in the church. Now, this is a little side note, but this particular attestation for Jesus' brother James being the, the main leader in the Jerusalem church, uh, that would cause a little bit of problem with uh, the Roman Catholic faith. Can anybody think of why the Roman Catholic faith would have a problem with James being the main leader? Because they suggest Peter was the pope, the first pope, the main leader of the church. And history documents that James, Jesus' brother, was the main leader of the first century church. A little bit of interesting trivia there. So there's the attestation, both biblically, Paul's manuscripts, and extra-biblical, about James being a leader in the church there. <clears throat> and we're covering this information to beg the question, what would have caused James's change from denying and rejecting his brother as the Messiah? Obviously, in the church, uh, we go straight to the resurrection event and the fact that Jesus resurrected to James. And uh, I've saved all those resurrection appearances for the last lesson. That'll be next week. And we'll look at all the resurrection accounts and how all the resurrection accounts for all these people changing their mind. But for now, I just thought we would look at the data and go, without the resurrection, somebody would have to be able to explain how these changes came about in these people. Uh, we find out that James was faithful to the church until his death. Um, most of this comes from extra-biblical, outside-of-the-Bible manuscripts. The first one we'll start with is uh, Josephus in Antiquity of the Jews. If you look at the top of page 6 there, uh, Josephus in that chapter, I believe it's chapter 20. Uh, no, book 20, chapter 9. Josephus, Antiquities, book 20, chapter 9, paragraph 200. This was written about 62 A.D., or he's covering this information in 62 A.D. So Josephus is talking about the different proc procurators that Rome had put over Judea. And during the time that one of these procurators in A.D. 62, Lucius Albinus, was made procurator, uh, he traveled away to Alexandria, I believe that's Egypt. He was traveling from Alexandria to Judea. I think that's from Egypt up to Palestine. Yeah. And while he was traveling, there was no Roman procurator in Judea. And so the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, the men that were the Jewish leaders at the time, took advantage of that lack of Roman oversight to get rid of a few of the Christians that they didn't like. So Josephus records it here for us. Paragraph 200. When therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he now had a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges, and he brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done. So Josephus records that the Sanhedrin, uh, the high priests, got together and they stoned the brother of Jesus 
for basically preaching against Jewish doctrine. This other account of the death of James, um, this was a PDF that I've had from the University of Chicago. And uh, in this PDF, they document Paul's visits to Jerusalem. They say Paul made five separate visits to Jerusalem. And uh, here's what they wrote in speaking of this. Uh, these revelations, speaking of Paul, he says, they occurred about 14 years before the writing of 2 Corinthians. And this epistle was written in A.D. 57. Both terminal years are to be counted in the 14. This was also the year of the death of James. So he's putting the death of James at 57 A.D. And it was also the imprisonment of Peter. Saul had now been preaching in Syria and Cilicia for 10 years. So the, this, this uh, particular PDF from the University of Chicago uh, dates the death of James at 57 A.D., although it looks like he was off because Josephus puts his stoning of James at 62 A.D. So there's about five years difference between those two dates. <clears throat> In another uh, history book, Civilizations of the Ancient Mediterranean, Volume 2, page 1054, uh, he also lists Jesus' brother. Early martyrdoms were at the hands of the Jews, and they were restricted to Palestine. So he lists Stephen as a martyr, James the Zebedee as a martyr, and Jesus' brother James. And he also gives us a footnote there, Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History uh, 2, and paragraph 23. A little later on in that same uh, book, let's see, that was page 1054, on page 1049 of that same history account there of Rome, on page 8 there of your handout, after the assassination of the leader, James's, Jesus' brother James, in A.D. 62. Okay, so this guy has him in A.D. 62 as well. So we've got two guys listing it in 62 and one guy in 57. I start liking it when you find corroboration between people. <clears throat> So Jesus' brother James was, was uh, assassinated in 62. The Jerusalem Christians left the city just before the outbreak of the Jewish War, 66 to 73. They moved to Pella in the Decapolis of Jordan. Whatever little information is preserved indicates that members of Jesus' family continued for some time in positions of leadership. And that's what I have on James. So he was a leader of the church that preached the resurrection of Jesus, and he remained a leader until he was stoned to death by the Jewish high priest Sanhedrin in AD 62. And somebody would have to ask, what changed Jesus' brother from ridiculing and not believing to all of a sudden believing the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth?